Okay, welcome everybody. So we have uh, another of our weekly bootstrap seminars. Um, and today we have a special fit because we have a joint seminar by Shota Komatsu <coughs> and Matej Zagerwurst and um, on uh, this exciting work, cosmological correlators and the bootstrap. And I believe Shota is going first and then about half an hour in, Matej will uh, take over. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thanks for introduction and thanks for inviting me uh, to this seminar series. So yes, I'm gonna talk about uh, cosmological correlators uh, and Matthias is going to talk about the relation to the bootstrap. So, so let me start uh, with this quote. Uh, we got the sign wrong. So you can actually like, well, I heard him saying several times, but like you can, actually also see him saying this like in the in the video that's uploaded on YouTube, uh, which is the interview uh, of Juan by uh, Atish Boker at ICTP. And of course, like he was when when he said the sign wrong, uh, he meant ADS versus DS. So ADS CFT is very is really great. But unfortunately, we don't live in a cosmological well, in a space time with with negative cosmological constant. Rather, we live in a space time with positive cosmological constant. And so that gives us enough reason to study DS. And, and indeed, like uh, there have been like a lot of works uh, about DS and cosmology uh, from theoretical point of view. And so this is just to show an oversimplified view on the subject. And on one end, uh, there are many people who are like uh, now analyzing the structure of the perturbation theory, uh, which is also partly motivated by recent developments of perturbation theory in ADS spacetime. And also there are like uh, more like uh, people who are more interested in like cosmology uh, and those people are studying uh, these perturbation also from EFT point of view. And here perturbation, by perturbation, I meant really like choosing some Lagrangian doing the perturbation theory. And furthermore, uh, uh, there have been like interesting, various interesting attempts to kind of system systematize this structure of the perturbation theory. And that which goes under the name of cosmological bootstrap or cosmological optical theorem. And on the other end, uh, there are string theorists uh, who are trying to construct uh, the the string theory background, uh, which is DS. And the famous example is this like a KKLT work. But in both approaches, uh, there are some, well, of course, there are some advantages, advantages and some drawbacks. And so in these approaches, like uh, it's intrinsically perturbative. Well, EFT is a little, is not the standard perturbation theory, but like it's also still perturbation theory in terms of like derivative expansions. And if you just take usual perturbation theory, then it's a model, model dependent. And on the other hand, on this side, uh, there are like various proposals, but uh, it's often hard to justify every detail of the construction because it often involves the strong coupling physics of string theory. So given this situation, and especially like if you're a bootstrapper, uh, it might be more natural to ask this question uh, rather than like a, looking at particular corners of this uh, DS construction. So the question is, uh, what are general rules of quantum gravity in DS or nearly DS? But as soon as you start thinking about this problem, then you realize that actually uh, the answer to a simpler question is not, not known, which is what are general rules of quantum field theory in DS? And that's basically uh, what I'm going to address. So, so let me just try to be concrete uh, about this question. So what do we want to answer? So, so there are like, of course, like a different people uh, will have different questions, but I just listed here three possibly like important questions. And the first question is what is the consequence of the bulk unitarity and bulk, bulk causality uh, in the late time correlation functions, so which you like, which are related to something you really observe in the uh, in the sky. And another question uh, you might ask is what is the CFT description of late time correlation functions? This question is of course motivated by ADS CFT, 
And then you can ask like, what are general properties of this CFT if it exists? And the third question, uh, which is related to the question of causality is how do we see the emergence of time? So in the usual ADS CFT correspondence, like a radio direction emerges uh, from the strong coupling physics of the strongly coupled CFT. But if there is analog of that for DS, then uh, you would say like uh, the time direction should emerge. And if it's true, then how do we see it from late time correlation functions? So today, I guess, well, I'm not going to talk about it, but uh, Matthias is going to talk about unitarity. Uh, but this question about causality is basically like widely open at this moment. Um, but that's in, I just want to emphasize that that's an important question. Okay, so as you are aware that like uh, both of us wrote uh, papers around the same time and some of the contents are overlapping. And this is just like a very, very brief summary of the two papers. So I wrote like both papers appeared in August. Uh, this is the paper that I wrote with Lorenzo Di Pietro and Victor Gorbenko. And this is the paper Matthias wrote with uh, Joao uh, and uh, Kamran. And both paper discusses uh, bulk unitarity, but probably like uh, using a different, slightly different perspectives. And, and but we, our paper uh, didn't really discuss the bootstrap aspect and that's discussed in this paper. And on the other hand, uh, we discussed uh, some relation between like a DS perturbation theory and ADS Lagrangian. And using that relation, uh, we discussed some kind of analyticity property of the cosmological correlators. And the plan of the talk today is that I'm going to cover this part and Matthias is going to cover the rest. Okay, so that's the plan. So, and let's start. So let's start with very, very basic, like a, a DS basics. So I just wanted to uh, make sure that everyone is on the same page. So this is the Penrose diagram of DS. And there is a coordinate uh, patch which covers the entire DS, which is called often called global, D, global slicing or global DS. And uh, typically it's parameterized in this way where omega d is the uh, metric of the d-dimensional sphere and tau is the global coordinate time. And if you know about ADS, then you should think of this as an analog of global ADS. And on the other hand, there are like, a, well, I just, there are many more slicings, but I just chose two slicings that are important for me. And one slicing is called Poincare slicing and which covers this part roughly half of the DS. So here, this is the future infinity and this is uh, past infinity. And the metric in the Poincare slicing is given by this. And as you can see explicitly from this, uh, this is very similar to the metric of the Poincare ADS. So you should think of this as the analog of Poincare ADS. And finally, there is a thing called static patch. Uh, so which, which is like uh, this part of the Penrose diagram. And I'm gonna explain why this is so, but like you should roughly think of it as an analog of Rindler ADS. Okay. So, so now if we want to do computation in the space-time, uh, you first need to choose a state and then do uh, some measurement in the infinite future. So that's what people normally call like a cosmological correlators. And that means that we first need to talk about the state, which state we are going to talk about. So the state we are going to talk about is a state which is invariant under the DS isometry. And you can define such a state even in interacting quantum field theory. And that's called like a bunch Davis vacuum. So in free field theory, there are people also discuss like various other uh, DS invariant states, which are often called like alpha, alpha states. But uh, as far as I know, like there is no like a natural way to define it in any interacting point of view theory. So I'm now going to just talk about Bunch Davis vacuum. And the reason why Bunch Davis vacuum is nice is because it has a kind of geometric definition. So the idea is that you take half of the DS and then analytically continue it to a sphere. And then you just like do the perform the pass integral on this sphere part and that produces for you the Bunch Davis vacuum. And 
So in this uh, analytic continuation, uh, th this global DS metric is analytically continued to the metric on a sphere, and theta is the coordinate uh, which is which goes like this, which is along this direction. And and I should also mention that like uh, this sphere picture also gives us some intuition about static patch, because instead of analytically. Sorry, in your picture you have phi. What is right. phi? Sorry. Yes, that's what I'm going to talk about. So, uh, so the so theta is the uh, what I was talking about, which is directly related to the D global DS time. But then I, you can also try to uh, like analytically continue one of the uh, angle direction, which is uh, periodic in this sphere coordinate. And then like if you analytically continue this phi coordinate, so this is just like a rotation like a, around this point. And then that becomes uh, the time for the static patch. And this basically gives you the reason why the sta static patch is the analog of the Rindler observable, uh, sorry, Rindler ADS. And so basically like a, this static patch time is uh, coming from the analytic continuation of something periodic. And that means that like uh, the physics in the static patch looks thermal and which is also a bit similar to Rindler ADS. Okay, so this was the comment that I that I wanted to make. But now, so so this uh, uh, analytic continuation to sphere is used for for uh, defining the bunch Davis vacuum. Can I, ask, uh, can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah, you 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 may you may this point that uh, the, the the static patch uh, time is like an analytic continuation of something periodic, but wouldn't we yeah. say would we say the same thing about the global time because it's an analytic condition of theta, and we can also imagine a rotation in theta. Uh, so that, but this theta in this parameterization uh, runs from zero to oh. pi. Okay. So because it like a, starts from the North Pole and it ends at South Pole, or well, maybe South Pole and North Pole, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay, yes. Cool. Right, so, but, uh, but then like, a, so in this picture, I talked about global and uh, static patch, but there is one important uh, yet another uh, patch, which is Poincare patch. And as I was saying that the Poincare patch really looks like a Poincare patch of ADS spacetime. And indeed, uh, you take this metric where eta is the uh, Poincare patch time direction, and then do this analytic continuation, like where Z is a plus minus I eta, then you get a metric of ADS, but with minus sign because of like one eta squared. So this basically says that if you take the DS and then do analytic continuation, you get minus ADS. But uh, given this relation, uh, it's very tempting uh, to conjecture that this eta equals zero, which is late time. So by the way, I didn't emphasize that, emphasize, but eta runs from minus infinity to zero. So eta equals zero late time, uh, it should be analog of Z equals zero, which is the boundary of ADS. So it's natural kind of to think that there should be some late time CFT so, or CFT describing the late time correlators. And of course, like in the absence of gravity, maybe it might be CT rather than CFT. But this conclusion is a little bit too fast because there is an important difference between ADS and DS. So let me just mention what that is. So, so that is, well, actually, so, so let's first review what the ADS computation was. So suppose we put some field theory, like a scalar field theory phi uh, in the interior of ADS. Then when you do the computation, basically you fix the boundary value of phi. Well, it's a little bit more complicated because you need to look at some fall of z, uh, phi as a function of z, but roughly speaking, uh, you fix the boundary value of phi to be some j, and then you do compute the pa uh, partition function of this and ADS. And the ADS CFT basically tells you that that, is produce, that produces for you the CFT partition function with the source term J. So in, more explicitly, it's given by this. And where O is the operator dual to this phi, scalar field phi. So in, in some sense, this is a boundary value problem. You fix the boundary and then you compute a partition function. But that's not what we do in DS because in DS, 
first you just prepare a state at the, uh, using like bunch Davis vacuum and then let it evolve until it reaches the late time surface. And then you just compute observables. And most importantly, at late time surface, we never fix the boundary condition. So the field is too fluctuating at late time surface. In other words, uh, this is uh, more like an initial value problem. And of course, like uh, well, if you are just talking about classical field theory or classical mechanics, the boundary value problem and initial value problem might look more as the same, except for the uh, signature. But in quantum mechanics, it's very different. So why is it different? So it's different because in the case uh, for the, the initial value problem, we need to use what's called in in contour. And so by, by that, I mean like a, you first prepare some uh, state and then like a let it time evolve. And then you also prepare a uh, cat and then let it time evolve and evaluate uh, some observable here. So this is different from like a computing S matrix because in the comp computation S matrix, if you express the inter in terms of pass integral, you just prepare some in state and then do the pass integral along the time and then like uh, project it to the, some out state that you want to compute. And so this is why it's called in, in formalism. And so as you can see from this, like we never really fix uh, the field configuration at late time. And the only way to fix the boundary condition at eta equals zero is to kind of like cut this uh, uh, pass integral contour and insert kind of complete set of field configuration like this. And then uh, each part, you can think of it as kind of analog of some S matrix like computation. So this is basically just the same as like using the wave function. So, so you first compute the wave function and then evaluate the operator and integrate over the arguments of the wave function. And now, once you like a decompose this computation to the wave function, then it looks very similar to ADS-CFT because we are fixing uh, the boundary condition at late time. And based on this, like a basically like a Maldasen and also like a Strominger uh, proposed that this wave function is given by some, uh, some CFT and it should be given by this expression. Sorry, and, but, uh, yeah. Um, are you even on the slide before that? Uh, you you're comparing Euclidean ADS with Lorenzi and the sitter, right? Right, right. I would argue that even for anti the sitter, if you're in Lorenzian signature, yeah, you yeah, would okay. still need to have a in in type prescription and button. That's that's true. That's true. Yes, and so, yes. But that, yeah, I don't know. It's slightly different viewpoint. I don't think it takes away anything from what you said. Uh, yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, but I, yeah, I don't have any other comment than okay. just referring to your paper. Sure. Okay, so so let me just like uh, draw a pic some pictures. So in in pictures, so the wave function, uh, the the one after you cut this pass integral. Is really like ADS CFT. You just like a fix the boundary condition uh, phi at eta equals zero, and that looks like uh, related to that. That is uh, something that people discuss in the context of DS CFT. On the other hand, if you really want to compute the correlation function, it's more like a, you prepare two states, like a, like a, this is one part of the in contour and the other part of the in contour, and you just glue them by doing this, and then evaluate the operator. So this is just like a pictorial representation of this beam being contour. And by inserting, uh, and as you can see, like uh, if you don't insert anything, this really looks like a something squared because this is bra and this is cat, and there should be some positivity. And indeed, there is a positivity uh, which comes from the unitarity, and that's what Matthias is going to talk about. So, so that basically comes from inserting resolution of identity here. Okay. So let me just make a few comments about this DSCFT picture. So this is some proposal like uh, made by Maldasena and Strominger, but I should say that no example is so far found in quantum gravity or string theory, except for some exotic examples like higher spin or like a lower dimensional example like JT gravity. However, I should also mention that if you take any quantum field theory instead of quantum gravity in DS and compute a wave function, 
then this wave function does indeed behave like CFD partition function. Like uh, the structure that you get is consistent with the CFD partition function. Sorry, is However, that just kinemat Sorry, is that just kinematics or there's more than that? Uh, I think it's basically kinematics. Thanks. But um, but however, this wave function picture is not very convenient for computing the correlation function, which is really the observable in this like, QFT PS. The reason is that like uh, suppose we want to interpret this expression using this like a DSCFT language, then what you need to do is very complicated. You first need to prepare two CFT partition function. So take two CFTs, and both of them are defined by a source term. And then you integrate the source term, integrate out the source term. And this is actually very complicated and it doesn't even look like like honest CFT computation. You need to like answer various questions like whether this uh, like integration over the sources is well defined. And also first of, first of all, if you start including finite source terms, then it's no longer CFT. However, uh, if you are just talking about QFT and DS, the final answer of the correlation function should respect the conformal symmetry. And this is also just because like uh, we are considering theory on DS and the DS isometry is isomorphic to conformal symmetry. So this leads to the main question that I want to uh, answer in the remaining maybe 10 minutes, uh, which is, is there any way to see this conformal structure of the correlation function more directly? But can I can ask you a question about previous slide. Yes. Uh, so one thing that's weird here is that, I mean, it, it seems somewhat tempting to interpret the correlation function that you write also as a correlation function in some CFT. But if you, if you would try to do that, then this would be a different CFT from the proposal at the top of the slide. Because yes, the, exactly. The CFT, yes. At the bottom of the slide, the wave function is not like the partition function. It's more like the action. It's like square root of the action. Right. right. So exactly, yeah. Is there a reason why there are like two CFTs? Like, isn't it natural to expect that there's just one CFT and this wave function is just its uh, action or something of this sort? Okay, so I think, right. I think in, if you just consider QFT and DS, it, it's indeed more natural to talk about CFT that directly describe uh, the correlation function. And that's basically what I, well, that's also related. So to you're basically I'm saying that the old DSCFT story was just a dead end and we should just give up. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> well, uh, in, if you consider QFT in DS, like uh, the old DSCFT may not, may not be the natural thing. Like it might be more natural yeah, to just okay. construct a CFT. But <laughs> if you consider quantum gravity in DS, then of course, like a uh, this one is more problematic because I don't know how to define the correlation function of local operator non-perturbatively in quantum gravity. Whereas uh, th uh, there is a better chance to define this wave function uh, in quantum gravity. But of course, then like all the questions, just like uh, all the difficulties just came to this performing this pass integral because in the presence of uh, quantum gravity, in the presence of gravity, this integral actually involves the integral over the metric, fluctuating metric at the late time surface. So I would say like uh, in the DSCFT, in, in our current understanding, uh, it seems more natural. Well, it seems easier to talk about wave function because we don't know how to directly talk about this. Okay, thanks. Uh, another comment is that the thing on the bottom might be conformal, but it's not a CFT, it has gravity, right? Right. Right, like if you include the gravity, right? Well, we're integ what? you're integrating over the you're integrating over the metric in that integral, right? Yes, 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 exactly. Right. Yeah, I completely agree. Yes, it it must be like uh, some gravity actually. It's not CFT. It shouldn't be CFT when you consider quantum gravity. Okay, so this is a question, and my answer is that. Then, so, so in this talk, I'm only going to talk about QFT in ADS. And my partial answer to this question, well, I, I'm lacking S here, but um, there is a Euclidean ADS Lagrangian 
uh, with twice number of fields than the original DS Lagrangian. And this basically kind of like uh, uh, gives you some indirect way of defining what this correlator CFT is. Because the Euclidean ADS Lagrangian has a natural interpretation of CF in terms of CFT. And furthermore, it compactly summarizes various findings that are in the literature, in particular, uh, recent nice papers by Slate and Tarona, uh, in which they uh, discovered the relation between e Euclidean ADS written diagrams and uh, DS diagrams. And our finding just like uh, promotes it to the promotes their findings to the Lagrangian level. Okay, so let's briefly discuss how it goes. So, so I should mention that this Euclidean ADS Lagrangian, we derive it, I'm going to derive it only at the level of perturbation theory. So the it maps part one perturbation theory to one, another perturbation theory. So in order to discuss that, let me just remind you what the structure of the perturbation theory. So again, we need to use this in in contour. So because we have in in contour, uh, we basically have like a, a two copies of quantum field theory, like a, whether so there are fields that that lives on here or a field that lives on here. And for example, that uh, if you do the perturbation theory using this formalism, then uh, you have Feynman diagrams, but now decorated by L and R, L or R, depending on the fields lives on the left contour or the right contour. And for example, if you consider five cube theory, like a, you, you get diagram like this but you can also change this R to let L. And obviously the building blocks of all these diagrams are propagators. So there are like a left left propagator and left right propagator and right left propagator and right right propagator. And this left left propagator is basically given by the time ordered pass integral because like uh, the, order of, the order of pass integral is the same as order of time. Uh, so it's given by like a time order part two point function of the free theory, whereas the right right uh, propagator is given by anti time ordered because time goes backwards here. And on the other hand, in the case of left right, then we always need to uh, put right on the left side of this two point function. So this basically gives you the white man propagator where ordering is fixed. Okay, so. So this is the building block of doing the perturbation theory. So let me just write it again here. And as we all know, uh, the difference between time ordered and anti-time ordered or different orderings are like a just difference of the i epsilon prescription. And for instance, if you want to get the time ordered correlation function, you just need to correlate uh, the imaginary part, small imaginary part uh, with the time. So you just need to like, uh, uh, multiply one minus i epsilon to each time where eta is the time. And on the other hand, if you want to get the anti-time ordered correlators, you just need to do the opposite. So you multiply one plus i epsilon. And, and nice, uh, luck, uh, fortunately, uh, if you start doing this, then actually automatically this also works. So by which I mean that what you need to do here is to uh, multiply small one minus i epsilon for the left part of the field and multiply one plus i epsilon for the right part of the field. And so this is what you need, to, what this like a general story of i epsilon prescri prescription tells you. And, but more physically, uh, what happens is that uh, if you consider this kind of like a, a time ordered or anti-time ordered correlation functions, and of course, like because it's in that, like a, in the Lorentzian kinematics, often there is a branch cut. For instance, like uh, typically there is a branch cut like, like this and eta, let me just remind you that eta runs from zero to minus infinity. And this minus one minus i epsilon or one plus i epsilon basically uh, tells you how to avoid this branch cut. So in the case of left, we have here, uh, we have a point here. In the case of right, we have point here. And now we want to, uh, uh, when we really do the computation by doing like a, a integral over the position, it's often easy to do the analytic continuation to the Euclidean spacetime, where Euclidean spacetime now is uh, ADS because I want to analytically continue this eta. And when, but when we do so, we should avoid uh, the branch cut contained in the uh, correlators. That's what we also do 
in the case of uh, flat space uh, amplitude or correlation functions. And this basically tells you that in the case of left, we need to analytically continue in this way. In the, in the case of right, uh, we need to analytically continue in this way. And in terms of formula, we get this expression. So, and so this is the- Can I ask a question? Yes. Can I ask a question about the, the two pages back? It's a bit of a technical yes. question. So, so this picture looks like um, you are actually preparing the initial state not in the bunch david state of the interacting theory but of the free theory indeed, and indeed yeah. then you move it forward so is there some hope that eventually it's going to relax to the to the state of the interacting theory as it normally happens in familiar context is this some is this something which you have in mind yeah that's something i have in mind i'm not sure to what extent it's proven but um well, at least like at the level of the computation, it gives a reasonable answer. But do you see that you really, in order to restore the uh, certain mm -hmm. variance in this setup, you really have to go to small eta? Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, um, yeah, I think that's true. Um, okay. Yeah, I think that's true. Okay, thanks. Okay, so so let, let me just go back to this. And so the analytic continuation we want to do is this one. And we just like, uh, because we know what these propagators are, uh, by solving the uh, uh, klein golden equation in DS, we, just, we can just like uh, do the analytic continuation. And if everything here is given by, uh, hypergeometric function and using the identity of the hypergeometric function you can see that after the analytic continuation left left right right and left right separately gives you this expression so interestingly uh, the single propagator is given by a linear combination of ads propagator with dimension delta and dimension d minus delta and with some uh, phase factors and this is essentially what was found uh, by Slate and Tarona uh, using the mainly in space approach. And I'm just like explaining how to do it all more direct, directly in the position space. Okay, so now we have these uh, various like uh, linear combination with the propagators. And now we want to derive ADS Lagrangian. And the idea is, okay, because like each left, left and right, right splits into two propagators. so. I just introduce uh, like a two sets of field for each left and right uh, field. So you, I first like I first like a double with a number of fields. So now we, we have like four fields, and then we require that the propagator of left delta left delta is given by this, for example, and that reproduces this, and left delta and right delta is given by this that reproduces this, and the interaction term is given in terms of like a phi left or phi right, which is the sum of phi left and phi left d minus delta. So I get this expression. And then if you write the Lagrangian, then you discover that actually two out of four fields actually simply decouple. And it doesn't like affect the interactions. So you can just like decouple them. And the remaining ones are some linear combination of some uh, left delta and right delta and left d minus delta and right d minus delta. And then what you need to do is to like a call this linear combination phi plus and phi minus, and then uh, rewrite Lagrangian in terms of this remaining, these remaining fields. So this is straightforward, but-, but mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, I had a question about your previous slide. Yes. Um, isn't this linear combination of propagators also a propagator? Like, is it not just the difference in, in boundary conditions for a single propagator? The linear to a normalization because they have the same mass right, right 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 yeah so they have same dimension so so yes the linear combination basically gives you the same property after yeah after normalization so i would also say that yeah it can just be a slightly weirdly normalized propagator plus some right right with some weird boundary conditions right right and then you can maybe directly introduce a single field for, for that weird propagation yeah. with weird boundary conditions. 
right and then maybe right. you don't need to have to introduce four fields out of which then can be coupled yeah i guess what you're saying that maybe there is a more direct way of getting these two but yeah, yeah. and yeah and i agree like I indeed like a yeah indeed in the end like a two out of four is, is like a doesn't play in, do, don't play any role okay Right, and if you just write, if you do that procedure, you get this Lagrangian. And so this one uh, obeys the boundary condition, which corresponds to dimension delta. And this phi minus has a boundary condition, which corresponds to D minus delta. But now importantly, the interaction term is a bit complicated linear combination because the interaction term was originally given by simple expression, phi left delta and phi left D minus delta. But now the surviving fields are some weird linear combination. So I need to rewrite uh, the simple expression in terms of surviving fields, and then you get this expression. So this is basically the ADS Lagrangian that you get. And once you get this Lagrangian, you can just forget about DS and then just compute everything using this ADS Lagrangian. And this ADS Lagrangian reproduces an extensive observations um, made in uh, Slate and Toronto for tree level exchange to arbitrary diagrams. Okay, so let me just give you a brief comments and how it can be used for. Uh, one way it can be used for is that now we have an ADS Lagrangian. So one can expect the late time four point function has similar structure as boundary four point function in the ADS, at least at the level of the perturbation theory. And one, and what is this similar structure? And one such structure that we expect is the conformal block expansion. So if you take a four point function and then like it can be expanded into, uh, uh, well, just using DS uh, logic, well, this is part, part of the stuff that Mat Matthias is going to explain, but just using the DS logic, you can you expect that it can be expanded into this conformal partial wave where the integral is along the principal series. And, but it doesn't tell you what this C delta is. So in the case of the ADS or usual CFT story, we expect that C delta is a meromorphic function and you can just like pull the contour and write a discrete sum. But it's not a priori guaranteed in DS, but because of this relation with the ADS, we expect C delta also to be meromorphic, at least in the perturbation theory. So this is one comment on the analyticity. Uh, I so this is what I just said. Uh, and, but we, okay, let me just skip this and just, uh, and- Sorry, but uh, it's meromorphic, not necessarily on the real axis though, the poles. What, right, what, the poles- Where do we expect the poles to be? The poles are not necessarily real axis because the reason is because if you look at the mass range, then for example, this, this mass range is like a natural mass range from the DS point of view, uh, but it's not necessarily so in a DS point of view. So what we expect is that like uh, the poles should come in pair, complex conjugate pair. And it, I think it should have like a, a positive real uh, part, but it can have an imaginary part as well. Sorry, that comes from some unitarity condition, the positive real part or? Okay, sorry, sorry. Yes, yeah, so, so, right. So what happens is that, so if you have, like a massive field in DS, then if you just have like a single massive free field in DS, like then there will be a pole on this principal series because the principal series is, a, is a, a unitary representation. But then if you start considering interaction, then there will be a kind of analog of the double trace operators made out of these fields. And those double trace operator typically sits here because the dimension adds up. If you have a d over two plus i nu, and if you like a multiply it by two, you get d plus two times i nu, which is somewhere here. Hmm. Okay, so let me just summarize and mention the future direction and pass it to Matthias. So uh, what I said is that there are two, what I emphasize is that there are two different notions in DS, wave function, which is relevant for DSCFT, and also correlation function. And that's what I talked about. And you can derive ADS Lagrangian for correlation functions in DS. And obviously, important question is to include gravity 
And in ADS, it, including gravity was simple, like you just needed to include T mu nu in the, in the CFT correlators. But in this, especially in this correlation function story, it's, it's quite different because as uh, Tom was pointing out, uh, this, uh, this some theory that this directly described correlation function might be conformal, but it won't be a uh, conformal field theory. It must include gravity. And one, another uh, slightly orthogonal direction, uh, which might be interesting is that, uh, so I, we like uh, derived, uh, we explained how to kind of convert the computation of like correlation function in DS, which is originally defined using in informalism uh, to ADS computation, which is more like a, a boundary value problem. So, so then you can ask, is there any flat space analog? So the flat, in the flat space, the analog of the wave function in which you specify the boundary condition at infinity is the S matrix. Whereas the analog of the S correlator is more like an inclusive observable or energy energy correlator, which are also computed by the in informalism. So there might be a formalism which recasts the computation of these observables uh, into something that looks like S matrix. Okay, so let me end here and sorry for going a bit over time. And Thank now, you very much. Mm -hmm. so we'll pass it to Matthijs. Yeah, let's pass it to Matthijs. Derek, can I make a quick comment? So you, yeah. you mentioned that gravity is a future direction, and you, you had a slide about how you can't include gravity because we don't know what it means non perturbatively. But then your discussion was all perturbative. We do know how to include gravity perturbatively. So um, would you say that at least at the perturbative level, gravity is is straightforward? What do you what do, what yeah, do you imagine? Sort of the future directions that need to be solved for okay okay yes at the at the perturbative level i think there are things we can do but i think like uh, not every detail is explained i think so could you comment on what you think is has not been explained so far okay okay so for example uh using this in informalism uh so the so gravity gravity has some effect even in at the perturbative level. Suppose we consider like a graviton exchange in this in informalism using this like a, this kind of pictorial explanation. So take one interaction vertex from the left side of the contour and the, and take another one from the right side of contour. Then this like a graviton actually propagates like a, through this late time surface, which basically like a, which basically means that some, there is some gravity wave passing through this late time surface which kind of changes the definition of the uh, lengths here. So already here, like you, I guess you need some gravitational dressing to really make like I have a well-defined observable. And I just wanted to like uh, work, I just wanted to say that it's nice to work out the details. So are you saying the details of diffeomorphism and variant observables haven't been fully worked out? Well, of course, in way? cosmology, of course, in cosmology, people did compute uh, like a, what you get, what what you can observe. But in the cosmological setup, like many things come at once. Like uh, there is a breaking of the S invariance, and also there is like a uh, reheating surface and things like that. So I was just saying that like, uh, there might be more like a minimal way of including the effect of graviton, uh, which is like a uh, more natural from say bootstrap point of view or like a for, from formal point of view and you're not at all concerned by the fact that people will tell you that the city space doesn't make sense non-perturbatively because it's uh, metastable or whatnot well okay i would say like a in quantum gravity I, yeah understanding this perturbation theory in a simple setup and clarifying details might help in doing the cosmological computation, maybe. Because, yeah, anyway, we do, DS is relevant for the cosmology. So. Of course, like we also need to include various other effects. Okay, thank you. So let's move on to Matthias.
we can't hear you, Matthias. We cannot hear you. I don't know if you're speaking. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think let me uh, try to share this way. Um, there we go, right? Okay, yeah. thanks, thanks everyone for um, for the invitation and thanks Shota for, um, for the first part of this talk. Uh, so this, uh, I will talk about uh, our paper that uh, that appeared also in August that was uh, in collaboration with uh, Jaap Inedonish and with, um, with Kamran who already spoke uh, here in the bootstrap collaboration a few months ago about ADS. Okay, so let me give a brief overview of what I, uh, I plan to discuss. Uh, so Shota already discussed uh, a lot of like, the global features of, of Q of T in rigid Decider and actually also of quantum Decider. Um, and I will again talk about correlation functions in the S, but from the bootstrap point of view. And let me already kind of spoil the, the take home message of, of my talk. So after when people will talk about the, the boundary CFT in the S, uh, this is said to be non unitary, right? This is a CFT that can have complex value scaling dimensions and it can have all sorts of bad features. But the, my, the message is that describing this theory as non-unitary misses the point. And in fact, the sitter has a good notion of unitarity that's just very different from the Euclidean notion of unitarity. And finally, there's um, some disclaimer that the sitter is a very well explored subject. So I will discuss some things that uh, also appeared in the paper of Showtime collaborators already in the literature a long time before, but often these results can, can be derived in different ways or they can be interpreted in different ways. So I won't be very exhaustive in, um, in citing people carefully. Okay, now let's, um, let's revisit, these, revisit these decider correlators. So we always think of these correlators in the, some symmetry preserving ground state. Um, so you can think of them in different ways. And uh, Shota already discussed the first two ways you can think of them. Well, one is by analytic continuum from the sphere, which is useful in, in various computations. Um, and the modern way of thinking about these decider correlators is by uh, deriving them from Euclidean ADS, which uh, Shota again discussed in great detail. But in uh, this part of the talk, we'll actually just think of these correlators really in, in the sitter itself. Um, so we're going to take an axiomatic point of view, like we always do in the bootstrap. So it's in some ways it's a bit awkward, right? We have to do a real-time physics. Uh, it's uh, it's a strange quantum system, but at the same time as bootstrappers, we understand very well how you should constrain correlation functions um, in uh, in in any QFT. Okay, so the the point of view of this talk will, will be that we just follow uh, this this intuition, follow our nose, and see where it takes us. Um, okay, so if you, right, we want to talk about unitarity. So if you talk about unitarity, you have to foliate uh, your space one way or another. And we will use this uh, Poincaré foliation that Schott already uh, introduced. So it's a foliation that covers half of the S. You see it here on the left, right? Yellow is uh, uh, infinite past. Red is infinite future where the, the late time CFT lives. And we will work in this foliation that covers half of the sitter. Uh, eight equals minus infinity is, is this dashed black line and eight evolves upward in time. Eight equals to zero is, uh, is late times. And these time slices are isomorphic to uh, RD. And there are these, in this picture, this uh, Penrose uh, compactification, there are these curved purple lines. Okay, so we're evolving upwards in time like this. And the main actors we'll be studying today are uh, these uh, endpoint ball correlators. Um, so, at a very basic level, we, we understand how we should think of these correlation functions. We're working rigid the sitter, so they're just constrained by the, uh, by the isometries of the sitter, not of ADS, that's a typo. So they, right, they transform uh, covariantly under, uh, under any of the sitter rotations. And crucially, um, we're working in real time. So any local bulk field, um, right, has, uh, there's a notion of hermeticity, right? There's a, there's a dagger. That, uh, that acts on, uh, on these operators. So concretely, it will be very uh, useful to just look at two-point functions. So we, have, we pick some field phi, we look at the two-point function of these fields, and just for simplicity, we have in mind that uh, these insertions are space-like separated. 
So in this drawing, you see here the two insertions. This is uh, late times, time is running upwards. Of course, right, you can also uh, work with time-like separated fields, but uh, I mean, Shota already discussed uh, the different, um, different orderings that one has to consider. But for the point of view of, of this talk, we can just uh, work with space-like separated points and uh, that will tell us everything we need to know. Sorry, are you eventually interested in taking the late time or you will yes, try yes, to you... push up everything at arbitrary times? No, no, we will be, we'll be mostly interested in late times, but to get there, the, the pedagogical way is to, to start in the bulk and to arrive at the, at the boundary later. Um, because here you, you cannot bootstrap this two-point function, but it's, uh, it kind of explains what's happening. Okay, so the, such a two-point function, um, Using the isometries, it's very easy to show that it depends on a single cross ratio. But uh, we want to uncover the consequences of unitarity. So we want to derive some uh, Chellon Lehman type representation. And to do so, right, you need to insert a complete basis of states in the middle. Okay. And if we want to get something out of this, we just need to understand the Hilbert space of uh, states in the sitter. So this we also, from general principles, we, we do understand this Hilbert space, right? So uh, in any QFT on some space, the, the states fall into representations of the isometry group, which in this case is just SOD plus one comma one, which we know is the Euclidean conformal group. And we also know what the representations are, right? They're infinite dimensional and as quantum numbers, they have some scaling dimension delta and some spin which right, can be any SOD representation, but for our purposes today, we'll just be a traceless symmetric tensor. And then you need some explicit description of the states and you need to actually explain how the generators of uh, the isometry group act on these states. So in the slicing that we use, right, this Poincaré slicing, states will win a multiplet. Uh, they're labeled by some position X mu. And then you need to specify uh, how the generators act on these states and it's uh, pretty easy to guess how they act, right? P mu uh, acts as a derivative uh, translation, uh, right? D, the generator of uh, dilatations acts like this. And you can kind of just guess how this works by using the fact that the DS isometry group is exactly the Euclidean conformal group. So, right, we know what the representations of, um, of the Euclidean conformal group are. Um, so indeed, it looks like the, these things on the right transform like local operators of dimension delta. But I want to stress that this is a mathematical curiosity. So indeed, these states, they behave like local operators, but it turns out that there are no operators that actually have these quantum numbers in the theory. So there's no state operator map, unlike say in, uh, in ADS or boundary CF, or in a normal CFT, okay? So the representations from the previous slide there, right? They, they work, but in a unitary theory, you need to only consider unitary irreducible representations. Of course, mathematicians know very well what, uh, what these representations are. So they, they restrict the values that the scaling dimension delta can take. And in particular, delta can be of the form D over two plus I nu, or there's some range of real values of delta that's allowed as well depending on uh, the spin of, uh, of the state in question. And these two families are known as principal or complementary series. And finally, there are some special D, de D dependent cases uh, of integer delta that are known as exceptional or discrete series, but I don't really wanna talk about uh, them for now. So concretely, um, we don't understand Hilbert spaces in the sitter very well. For instance, you can put a CFT on the sitter and then we understand roughly speaking which kind of states appear just by starting from the, the usual CFT states and breaking the conformal group down to the sitter group. Uh, if you look at say a scalar field, we understand single particle states also, but already at the, at the level of multi-particle states, things get very complicated because if you want to construct two or three particle states in the sitter, you already start have to, having to use these uh, Clebsch Gordon symbols of, uh, of SOD plus one comma one. So this is just an intrinsically difficult problem. It's not easy to write down Fox space states in, uh, in the sitter. And of course, everyone knows that uh, these, these representations, they're not, right? The unitarity conditions are very different from unitarity in the usual CFT, but um, that uh, I don't have to explain this to this audience. Okay. 
so let's get back to this, uh, the case of this two point function. Um, we can right if as long as we understand this Hilbert space, we can just turn the crank and uh, and derive a Chalon Lehman representation. So we insert a basis of states that you see here, and then you you uh, analyze the consequences of symmetries on on these matrix elements. Well, there it turns out that they're uniquely determined by the isometries of the sitter. So we can write these matrix elements as something that's fixed by symmetry, something universal times a coefficient. And bringing everything together, you get the desired Chalon Lehman representation. So there's a uh, some density row of delta that's positive. And then there's a universal function f delta of xi that, uh, that encodes the kinematics of this correlator. So this relation is really the first, first avatar of unitarity in, in the Siderberg. There's a notion of positivity here at the level of the two point function. And these f's, I think, in show this talk, they were called, uh, they were called g's. They're, they're Weidman propagators of, uh, of fields in the Sitter. And they diagonalize the, the, the sitter Laplacian. Okay. Um, so now concretely, um, what can we do with this relation? Well, this density, it's computable in examples. Um, it's always a smooth distribution that has support on the principal series. Actually, it should be an integral here, not a sum. Um, in exceptional cases, it can happen that there's some pole crossing phenomena so that, that forces uh, this integral to also have some support, some uh, at isolated points in the complementary series, but uh, in general, it's uh, it only has support on the principal series. And finally, in our paper, we show that rho can be obtained from the two point function via some uh, Foissart rebuff type inversion formula, but I won't have time to talk about it in uh, in this talk. So it's a known result, of course, this this uh, Chalon Lehman representation of the two point function, but often it's derived in a different way. Okay, now let's talk about the late time physics, which uh, shows already mentioned, and which Leonardo was asking about. So here, this this density row of delta, it has the same interpretation as in flat space, um, but it doesn't really relate to the late time physics. So pragmatically, how can we recover the late time physics? Well, we can just uh, right put one of the insertions very close to late times and expand the correlator in a Taylor series. So you get right this correlator as some some power series in the time eta times something. This, this is not really a covariant um, expression, right? We know that G only depends on this cross ratio. So you can covariantize this expression. And it turns out that the, the objects that appear on the right hand side are boundary conformal blocks. So I write in here as F hat. Um, they appear with some coefficients C of K that are theory dependent. And then, right, the, they appear with some, some labels gamma K, right? They're the, the exponents that appear here. And this uh, formula has a simple interpretation. These gamma k's are quantum numbers of the late time operators uh, O, right? The operators that live with this uh, it equals to zero time slice. So indeed we can interpret these, these gamma k's as scaling dimensions and we'll just write delta k from now on. But here's a very important point that this spectrum is completely unrelated to the, the set of unitary uh, representations of the sitter. So these delta k's, they can have arbitrary real part, arbitrary imaginary part. They don't live on the principal series in general or the complementary series. And hermeticity only requires that both delta and delta k appear. So that, that's all there is. There are no further unitarity constraints on, uh, on these numbers. And often this, okay, uh, often uh, this, um, this relation can be written in the following way. If you take some bulk field and you, you can write it as a sum over all boundary operators with some theory dependent coefficients B. Um, so this relation is very similar to what one writes down in say uh, BCFT or ADS, but I have to stress that this relation is really not at the same level of rigor as, uh, as in those cases, because there we do have a state operator map so we can make this equation mathematically precise. And in the case of the sitter, this is an equation that works heuristically. Um, it's a true equation at the physics level, but it's hard, if not impossible, to prove it uh, with the level of rigor of mathematical physics. Sorry, Matthias, can I make a short comment, if you can hear me? Uh, yes. I, yeah, I, I think there is one more constraint, right? Because if the real part is smaller than d over 2, then it has to be real, right? The, and 
if real part is larger than d over two, then it can have an imaginary part, and then they have to come in complex conjugate pairs. Do you agree with this? Uh, well, I I can imagine also something that uh, where it's smaller than d over two, but it has it comes in a pair. Just uh, you would need some kind of right. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't think that that would be allowed by unitary. Well, okay, we can say that that's not proven, but. But at least at the level of the conjecture and at the level of known examples, I think it is true. Yes. Okay. But this is more of a, okay. It's maybe, maybe again, heuristically, this is true, but it's not, it doesn't follow from this, this logic, uh, as far as I know. That's not obvious to follow up on this logic. Yeah, okay. So here, just, I want to draw a little picture to, uh, to compare the, these two views. So on the one hand, we have this picture of the, the two-point function as an integral over the principal series with some density rho. On the other hand, we have uh, the two-point function as a sum over boundary conformal blocks with some other coefficients. And the relation between the two is given by uh, the usual contour pulling tricks. So here on the left side, you see the, the path of integration. I've drawn also some hypothetical support on the for the complementary series, but it's probably not there. Um, so to to see the relation between the two sides, you right, you can assume that this density rho is meromorphic away from the principal series in a k sufficiently fast at infinity, and then you can write write down some split representation for this ds propagator. You close the contour and you right, you pick up the the poles which are precisely at these um, these delta k's right, which can be either real or they can come in uh, conjugate pairs as a show already mentioned. Okay, so these are the two different ways of thinking about uh, a two-point function. Good. Sorry um, about this. Um, yes. How, I, I missed how you got this, uh, the rightmost of the two uh, representations of this correlator in terms of boundary blocks. So the, I thought it followed from, from Basically, this counterpulling thing. Like, how did you get the discrete sum on the on the right? Oh, I mean, before I didn't derive it. I just gave a heuristic argument that, in practice, you can just do a Taylor series that you around eight equals to zero. You you covariantize this, and you would find these these boundary conform blocks. But this is the real derivation, of course. Above, I was just uh, trying to to be a bit more pedagogical. But this is this is. This is mathematically the relation between these two representations. I guess my, my question is, how do you know that rho is not just meromorphic, but even analytic? Like rho is some density. So why are there no delta functions in, in rho, for example? Well, OK, this is a good question. And this is, uh, so here, it's right from the point of view of DS, without invoking any other principles, it's very difficult to to prove anything about row away from the principal series, you just right. You need some 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 higher principles, I guess, to do so. So here, this is a heuristic derivation assuming analyticity. But um, right, if there were branch cuts or right any funky business, then uh, it it would ruin this right this representation on the right for sure. Yeah. So is it uh, is it true that like in all the examples where you've looked at where you can actually compute its density, there are no delta functions on the principal series? It's just uh, it's just a meromorphic thing. In uh, in all the examples we know, this this bulk to boundary OPE it converges. It gives the right answer. So um, um, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure if uh, if having delta function on the principal series would be in contradiction with. That. Oh no, in, in, on the principal series, in the case okay, in the case of the just the the free two point function. There are two delta function e in the principal series, but uh, I thought that Bald was asking about something more. Right? Th that's that's a very special case. In all other known examples, rho is really a smooth distribution on the principal series. Uh, but the, the free two point function is indeed an example of. Um, maybe maybe one comment I can make is that uh, complementary series can show up, and usually the case is that it's a, a bunch of like poles that when you analytically continue to. Uh, for example, like in case of four point function, the external dimensions, when you analytically continue them, they can cross uh, as like some poles in this integral and they, they show up some pole crossing complementary C. But in known examples, usually principal series is just uh, enough. So that's maybe one comment. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, 
yeah, so so maybe Shota was mentioning a few things about how, how perhaps to understand this this analyticity from the, the ADS point of view, but um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, so the logic, right? So above we just spelled out some logic uh, for the two-point function, but it, uh, this, this logic applies to any correlation function in the S, right? So we can look at uh, operate uh, at correlation function of bulk operators, uh, correlation function of playtime operators, or even both. And um, so, indeed, if we start to look at uh, correlation function of playtime operators, so it's important to realize that hermeticity, right? It it uh, it again it guarantees that these operators appear in pairs. If there's an operator of dimension delta, then there's a conjugate operator O dagger of dimension delta star. And only real operators are, are self-conjugate. So if we want to get some mileage out of this logic, then we can look at the, the four-point function of four scalar operators, as we always do in the bootstrap. At this point, right, since these operators all live on the eight equals to zero time slice, they're by construction space like separated. So this is a this is a Weibman function, and the kinematics are purely Euclidean. And uh, we, right, the kinematics of such a four-point function are well understood, and we, we know very well that uh, such a four-point function depends on two cross ratios, say Z and Z bar. Okay, so now let's uh, say, see what we can say about uh, unitarity of such four-point functions. In principle, we can really revisit the same argument that we did for the two-point functions. So we insert a complete basis of states in the middle. Uh, and right, we, we rewrite this in some covariant way. So this uh, makes these shadow integrals appear that have uh, appeared in the bootstrap literature before. And these shadow integrals give precisely uh, these conformal partial waves that are a linear combination of conformal blocks and their shadow counterpart and that are defined, that are single valued on uh, the full complex plane. And finally, there's some, some theory dependent coefficient that appears, right, that's not fixed by symmetry, some, some uh, spectral density I of delta. In this case, there is not only an integral over the principal series, but there's also some over spins that appears. So these formulas are right, in the, um, the case of Euclidean CFT, we, we know these formulas, but often they're derived uh, using the like kind of opposite logic. Normally you think of Euclidean four point function as a sum over conformal blocks. And then we say, look, these, these uh, partial waves our complete basis of function. So we can actually also write uh, a CFT four point function in this way. And here actually we, the logic is the opposite way. This is the definition of the four point function of late time operators in the sitter. If you really insist, you can pull the contour. You can write this as a sum over conformal blocks with some OPE coefficients, but this is really a more fundamental representation. And in particular, uh, this representation makes the unitarity manifest in the sense that if the pairs say O1 and O2 are conjugate to the pairs O3 and uh, to the pair O3 and O4, then this is a manifestly positive quantity. So positivity is manifest for this representation, but if we pull the contour or write the thing as a sum over OPE coefficients, then unitarity loses its power. The OPE coefficients are generally complex. Okay. Um, there are some more things that can be said about such a four-point function. Of course, since it's a Weidman function, it's right. It obeys crossing symmetry, which is exactly the same as in usual CFT. And as a consequence, it follows that these densities I of delta, there are solutions to system of bootstrap equations with positivity conditions that uh, that are spelled out here. Okay, and of course, the main difference is that uh, these operators, oh right their scaling dimensions do not obey unitarity bounds. So that's really uh, an important difference from the usual bootstrap. Their scaling dimensions are just generic complex numbers with real part bigger than the over two. Um, so this is a non-intuitive way of thinking about four point functions. So let's think of a few examples. The simplest one is a free theory. And I think Shota already evoked this. So if we have, um, a massive boson phi, then from the point of view of the boundary CFT, this is a tensor product of two GFFs with a scaling dimension D over two plus or minus I mu. So 
on the complex plane, you draw them here. And the first thing that uh, you can try to do is compute this density i for the four point function O, O dagger, O dagger, O, which is right, uh, reflection positive. And uh, we did this exercise, but it's already highly non trivial, right? It's, it's a complicated computation. Uh, I will maybe come back to this uh, a bit later. Then you can look at uh, weak coupling. Um, indeed, right now we understand that. Right, the Sitter physics is closely related to ADS. So right, we, this is just right, the, the, or, the free theory is just a product of GFFs and ADS. And we also understand how you comp should uh, compute corrections to this, right? Uh, you have contact diagrams and exchange diagrams and ADS. So whenever you know the spectral representation of such a diagram, you can see the concept, right? You can check that uh, unitarity is satisfied at least for some choices of the couplings, right? So you can prove some, you can put some um, perturbative unitarity bounds on, on couplings, uh, at least at tree level in, in the sitter. So this is something that has not really been done in the literature. We look at a single diagram, but it's a source of multiple examples if you want to put in the work. Um, you could think of RG flows. I'm a little confused by this discussion. So there's no oh, rigorous unitarity bound. We can only get some some perturbative. No, no. I, I'm, I'm saying that. Look, say you. Of course, unitarity is, is encoded by positivity of um, of the spectral density. The point is that okay, we, we know very little examples of um, of such four point functions in the sitter. So the simplest things you can do if you want to go beyond the free theory is to look at say contact diagrams in DS, exchange diagrams in DS. These we know how to compute. So, uh, but yeah, no, no, they're in, in principle, right? I, I would what about the no solvable model? What about the large N or N model in a DS3 or something like it? Or? Uh, large N O N. Um, I'm not sure that. Uh, I mean, I was just it was just a random thing that just came to mind, but. I'm sure. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe uh, I'm not sure if uh, if maybe um, Ashota and his collaborators are thinking about this, but. Um, uh, yes, I mean we have done some calculation, but uh, at the moment I don't remember if we checked positivity. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's there's one um, one interesting scenario that I want to evoke, namely that of RG flows in rigid the sitter. So there's uh, we know that CFTs in the sitter have a very special property, namely that all their scaling dimensions are real. So if you look at a four point function in uh, in a CFT, it has poles only on the real axis. But massive theories in the sitter have poles that are right generically complex. So if you have an R, suppose that there's an RG flow to unitary CFT and rigid the sitter, then our prediction is that precisely when you hit uh, the IR fixed point, right, all the spectrum of um, uh, anomalous dimensions, right, all the, the scaling dimensions will have to move towards the real line. So this is a diagnostic of, uh, of ball conformal symmetry, if you wish. But again, this has not been spelled out in, in any example. Okay. So, since this is the bootstrap seminar, I think it's worth it to make a few more technical remarks. So indeed, as I said, we should work, we should think about these correlation functions in the spectral representation. So as a matter of principle, uh, all unitary irreps can appear in this integral. So you can have principal series, complementary series, and even discrete series of representations in this summer integral. It seems from more or less general principles that typically the principal series is sufficient modulo find a number of other terms and of course sometimes you have to add an identity operator contribution as well and this follows from an argument that was given by simmons duffin stanford and witten in um, in their paper on the minkowski inversion formula but it had nothing to do with uh, with ds physics so it would be nice to understand this this representation in detail in, in examples uh, another technical detail that's important is that the spectral integrals uh, need to be analyzed carefully, right? We know again from the Euclidean case that they can diverge if the external dimensions have sufficiently large real parts. 
of course, this is a problem that, that we know. And uh, indeed, in the bootstrap literature, this is more or less understood uh, from the point of view of the Minkowski inversion formula and how to deal with these, these divergences. So in the, the existing literature, you find uh, a good discussion of this, although in, in our work, we didn't uh, go into great detail, at least not in the d-dimensional case. There's one very delicate point of view that appears at the level of mean field theory. So if you want to exhibit positivity at the level of mean field theory, you have to take into account some ultra local terms, some delta function contributions that are really specific to the sitter. They don't appear normally in GFF, but precisely because in this the sitter GFF, scaling dimensions add up to D, you can have these ultra local terms and they are needed to re recover unitarity. If you don't include these, these delta function terms, then you would conclude that uh, mean field theory is non unitary. So this is a bit strange. Normally, in uh, right in conformal bootstrap, we want to exclude these ultra local contributions, and probably in interacting theories, these these things kind of get smoothed out. But uh, at least at this level, you have to be very careful. And if you try to analyze these correlation functions using like a derivative type expansion, you would be insensitive to this. So in the final part of this talk, I want to. Uh, briefly sketch how one can set up a bootstrap, what's known and uh, what's not known yet. So uh, as usual, we have some arsenal of tricks up our sleeves. We can impose gaps, right? We can make some assumptions about the support of these integrals or uh, the values that these spectral densities can take. We can maybe assume some functional forms, but um, right, it's important to have some phenomenological input of what are the interesting questions. But uh, for now, there are already a lot of technical difficulties. Here. Let's, right, before we go into the, the real deep physics questions, let's just show that as a matter of principle, um, these bootstrap equations can be used for something productive. So in the toy example that we study, we look at the Can I ask yeah. a question? Uh, about the previous slide. Um, I don't know if you already said it. I'm sorry, I got disconnected for a while, but uh, um, did you say something about how fast it converges with some in generic case, this the, the integral over delta? Well, the, these integrals, so it, the, the rate of convergence depends on the external dimension. So if you make the external dimensions very large and you have some crossing, that, right? It, it depends, okay, if you have some general function on the left-hand side, then the convergence, right? It depends on the behavior of, um, of this function near z equals to one and z equals to infinity. Of course, in a crossing symmetric four-point function, right? The, this only depends on, um, on the, the external dimensions, at least if there's an identity, uh, identity block present. So if the, I mean, for fixed L, they go like, right? So these integrals go, right? They, they don't depend on delta, they depend on nu. So the writing delta is d over two plus i nu. And then they go like a power of, of nu, nu to, to the delta basically uh, minus something that the precise value depends on, I guess on the number of space time dimensions. So if the external dimensions are too large, then, uh, then this thing does not converge, uh, at least not, uh, yeah, not, there, there's no, no absolute convergence. Um, yeah, but this, is this really the same issue? I mean, I, I see that is this the same issue that appears in mean theory? So is this these local terms in mean theory some? Uh, no, no, the, 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 the local. Well, I mean, the, the two, the fact that these appear, that it's related, but uh, right, the the local terms, right? They they also come from a rapidly growing growing spectral density, right? It, it's an explicit, in the case of mean field theory, this is an explicitly known spectral density. Um, and it, it's very similar actually to, to the other terms. So they're right in the mean field theory, there are different terms that appear, right? They're just normal local terms. There's this ultra local term, but they, they go with the same power of nu. And so if the scaling dimension are smaller than the external scaling dimension, so there is a range in which you can make this exponentially convergent like a four four point function in CFT style or or not? So yeah, but, but even problem. even even in normal Euclidean CFT, this is exactly the same problem, right? These uh, 
no, but in the normal in CFT, we run into this problem because we kind of say, okay, we try to expand this function in some basis, but the function just doesn't belong to the space. Uh, well, here you said, well, let's just take this function and insert the full basis of intermediate states. So it looked like all the steps that you performed were pretty safe. So it seems to be harder to, to interpret to live with this divergence. So I don't know, you, you probably have some way of living with it, but there. So which steps that you like, the Kellen Lemon, usually Kellen Lemon representation, the quantum field theory doesn't diverge usually. Yes, normally those uh, precise. So at the end of the day, this, um, these representations have to reproduce the, the correct four-point function. Um, of course, there, there are the usual caveats of uh, right, having to subtract like identity contributions, but that's, uh, that's familiar. Um, well, the question is whether if you take the vacuum and you act with two of these operators, you get normalizable state. Yeah, this, this is... Guarantee. I mean, we don't know anything about this operator, so how do we know yeah. whether it keeps an amount? Yeah, so this, this indeed, uh, uh, Piotr, is, um, is a good problem in the sense that, right, okay, you would think that, right, as I said, the Hilbert space of the theory, properly speaking, it's, right, it's a set of uh, states that support on the principal series and those states of delta function normalization. If you just take the, the bunch Davies vacuum, you insert one of those late time operators Right, it's not a state that that has support on this principal series. Right, it doesn't have the right quantum numbers. So at th this point, you have to you have to interpret these these states right as something like uh, metastable states. They're not really part of the Hilbert space of the theory, but they're not unrelated to it either. Um, but this is precisely why it's difficult to prove structural problems about about this thing right if if they were right if you could act with any number of these these late time operators uh on the vacuum state and you could express it in terms of uh hilbert space states yeah then then you'd be in good shape but um yeah this is a complication of the sitter physics that we we i mean we understand the problem but uh making this precise at the level of uh of mathematical physics is, is very complicated. So yeah, but uh, I, I think problem is a bit similar to at least technically to just the fact that momentum, uh, well, Fourier transform of a, a propagator of, you know, just two local fields in flat space can be divergent, right? And this is, again, because if you insert a local operator, it produces uh, a space with arbitrary energy. Uh, so in principle, I think, I know, Slava, do you see anything wrong with... Well, yeah, with transform, the, yes, but not, but not the spectral density. Spectral density is... No, but, but this is... Measure. But you can, we can think of Fourier transform, I mean, in momentum space. Of, let's take the Whiteman propagator in the flat space, right? And, and insert identity in momentum space uh, in between the two points, right? So that will produce the Fourier transform of a Whiteman propagator. Uh, which we can also think as a, you know, decomposition into the Hilbert space of momentum eigenstate. Uh, and uh, of eigenstates of four momentum. Uh, okay, uh, and that thing will be, it will be a divergent integral, right? But I'm not just thinking, about, why are you talking about Fourier transform? Let's just talk about Chen Lehmann with a positive spectral measure. Those things don't, don't diverge as far as I know. The Fourier transform Those? example is misleading. Either because uh, why you, well because you, you can take Fourier transform and sure like let's say you just take vacuum you take Fourier transform of local field and you act in the vacuum sure this is not a normalizable state but this is like a, almost a normalizable state in sense it's delta function normalizable so what Matthias mm -hmm. was saying is that the situation here is completely different you take a bunch of this vacuum and you act on it with some you can act on it with some uh, field like late time field with some quantum number so that this quantum numbers are not going to be even like a delta normalizable state inside the principal series it's just going to be somewhere off for example the operator like this momentum p if it's mirrored with some small smooth test functions and in, in, in p you'll get a normalizable state here you there is no way to do this like no matter what you do you're not going to change the 
can for presentation which is a state lease you can smear it whatever you want you're well, not going to move it to, towards the principal series so it's kind of very far outside of the uh hubris space yeah well there are two there are two problems i think a little bit overlapping well i okay i, I don't know if we should go into that discussion right now but uh, a short comment is that i think uh, you can also take i know matthias uh, uh, there is also a problem in principle if you consider light fields on complementary series as internal ones right this integral if i remember correctly is not guaranteed to converge and then uh, this issue with not having unitary representations goes away, right? Yeah, but there you have to ask whether it will converge if you smear these fields in the... In yeah, the yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. And then if you smear them a little bit, then I think it will converge. And that's why I'm saying it's a similar problem to my uh, flat space free transform example. Yeah, but this uh, form and, is completely uh, understood. It's just because you're doing something that's guaranteed to be a stupid thing to do in some sense, and you're getting an infinite answer. And if you do the correct thing, then you get a finite answer. <laughs> like the yeah, problem yeah, is, so, the other fields is that like no matter what you do, it doesn't seem that well. You can the, pr the problem with the other fields, the problem with the other fields is that they are okay. It's it's not understood, of course, but the intuition is that there's something similar to you know resonances in uh, some you know s matrix language so okay you can think of a resonance as some sort of non-normalizable you know badly non-normalizable state in your hilbert space right and do some formal manipulations with it but of course if you want to do some you know hilbert state meaningful representation uh, manipulations you need to think of your resonance as decomposed into states that actually belong to hilbert space and that's probably what you should do here as well instead of inserting these operators uh, you know exactly these complex values you should insert some, uh, you know, their projections on the principal series in some way. Again, so find some wave function of this resonance that actually belongs to the Hilbert space. But yes, I mean that, that's uh, uh, it's a different subtle. Let anyway, me give, I shut up. Let me give a very radical example where maybe it's, you can understand what's good and what's bad. Okay, let's just try to compute the two-point function of late time operators OO by inserting a resolution of the identity. If you insert principal series states, you get zero, right? There, these, these operators don't have support on the principal series, so that would allow you to compute that, right? These operators just don't have any, um, uh, any two-point function, even though we know very well what the two-point function uh, is, right, in, uh, in CFT. And indeed, if you just assign the right two-point functions, then you, you can reproduce, for instance, the, right? You can reproduce the bulk two-point function using this bulk to boundary OPE. So at the physics level, this is a completely sane thing to do. It works, it converges. But right, at the level of this channel Lehman representation, we would say that this, this correlation function just doesn't exist. It has a vanishing spectral density. Um, yeah, so this is... Um, yeah, this is a delicate point and it, I, it should be clarified, but it's not, it's not right using this kind of obvious analysis, you cannot uh, get to some, some very clean resolution of this, this problem. Maybe we can, uh, can discuss a bit uh, later. I have like one or two more slides and uh, then uh, more complaints can be aired. Okay, so uh, let's talk about like the, the simplest example that, that you can spell out. So that's the case of a uh, one-dimensional late time CFT, which corresponds to two-dimensional bulk the sitter. The partial waves are, uh, are explicitly known in this case. So it's a nice sandbox for, for performing this uh, cosmological correlator bootstrap. So the simplest thing you can write down is just the four-point function of a real operator of dimension a little bit above one half. And in that case, you can prove that only spin zero and some discrete series uh, states can appear in the spectral uh, representation. And the trick we use is to apply a kind of functional that softens divergences. So you integrate uh, the four point function against something uh, z to the gamma one minus z to the sigma. And if you do this, you get a very concrete crossing equation, right? So on the one hand, you have this integral over the principal series with some numbers that depend on gamma and sigma. And here you get a second contribution of uh, discrete series terms that are specific to one dimension. Again, here there's some theory dependent numbers, I tilde, here there's some universal objects, uh, F tilde again. And delta here is a contribution of the identity block. Um, and this is now something that you can study using the usual conform bootstrap logic. For instance, this, uh, these things 
uh, for sufficiently large nu, nu bigger than eight, I believe, right? So, so we pick some, some value of delta. I think delta is uh, 0.6, more or less. We pick some values of gamma and sigma, and you see that this is a positive distribution for sufficiently large nu. These numbers are also positive. Um, so at that point, you can just apply the usual bootstrap logic and, and put some bounds on, uh, on these quantities, for instance, uh, I tilde 2 comma 0. So this is uh, just as a matter of principle, it shows you that if you take some smart regulator, some smart functional, then you can get some right, physical content out of this equation and prove some bounds on, uh, on dynamical quantities. But uh, we, of course, this is very far from performing full conformal bootstrap in this, this d-dimensional cosmological setting. So let me just uh, summarize with a few points. Um, we talked a lot about formal things today, but at the end of the day, Shota reminded us that the DS, these cosmological correlation functions, they, they tell us something about the real universe, about uh, the inflationary era. And there is already a cosmological bootstrap program that studies these tree level interactions. And so, the physics question is that what actually should we as bootstrappers bring to the table? Finally, there's a lot of uh, formal stuff that happens in this the sitter context, right? this um, harmonic analysis of non-compact groups, so that, uh, that hardcore mathematics. But at the end of the day, we know very few examples that have been worked out. So especially because there are some subtleties that have to do with convergence. Um, it would be good to study some simple models. So uh, this is wide open as far as I know, very, uh, very few things have been uh, analyzed in detail. So it would be good to understand these lay time CFTs and some spectral densities beyond the most trivial cases. Then um, another question for the more pragmatic question is that how does one, can, how does one really extract information from this DS crossing equation? because you cannot just apply the standard as, as DPB logic um, and right, the, the, the crossing formulas look similar from a formal point of view, but in practice, they're quite different. So one important question is that, how does one actually get, get useful information from these crossing equations um, for at a meta mathematical level, it's right, the objects that appear if you try to Right, Re phrase this crossing symmetry in the most most elegant way are crossing kernels or 6J symbols that have been studied at least formally in great detail, but in practice um, they have not been used in, in the bootstrap, in the numerical bootstrap setting. So it's an open question whether one can make sense of, uh, of cosmological correlators using these uh, 6J symbols. And finally, of course, there's uh, a whole issue of um, of uh, DSCFT and quantum gravity. There, there are some, of course, some uh, examples of DSCFT that have appeared in the literature, but it's, as far as I know, still an open question, for instance, what kind of late time CFT is a good, uh, good candidate for like quantum, quantum de Sitter theory and so forth. Uh, and uh, well, I have nothing to say about this, but this is a more conceptual problem that, uh, that should be addressed. So thanks for your time. Thank you, both of you, for this great double feature. So we had, um, you know, we have it's been a longer seminar than usual. We already had we have many questions, but there are a couple of questions. We can take them now. Uh, I, I have a question, which is like, you have this setup when you have uh, a, let's say, QFT in DS, and you take this late time limit. So is it possible to make sense of this situation when you put a conformal field theory in DS and you sort of then it's the same as putting it on, uh, uh, at least naively it seems that it's the same as putting it on like uh, Minkowski space where you put the boundary t equals zero. Precisely like, uh, like uh, it's like, so we, we study this very briefly, but it's, it's not difficult to understand what happens. So, um, I said before that you only get real operators and the, the boundary CFT is basically built out of um, just the restriction of an operator to a finite time slice and time derivatives of that operator. Because uh, from the point, right, from the point of view of CFT, you, sorry, let me go to this picture of, uh, of DS as a finite cylinder. 
right? Uh, ds is, is while equivalent to a finite slice, of, a finite uh, section of the full Minkowski cylinder. So there's nothing special about like the lay time, uh, right? This lay time slice. Yeah, yeah, of course. So it's like a dimensional reduction of, uh, of the real CFT. And in principle, you can write, you, so you get the operator and its time derivatives. And in principle, yes. you you're talking about the situation when the, the there's like a trivial defect at time equals zero, but you can also yeah. imagine there is a non-trivial like non-trivial boundary condition. Yeah, there's a. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's it's not precise. It's not the fields don't have any boundary condition. It's just uh, the, I guess the transparent defect, if you wish. Yeah, but what I mean is that if you could imagine putting a non-trivial conformal boundary. Uh, at time equals zero, then I think it all would also be satisfying your equation. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you can take any, right, any CFT on the annulus, if you wish, with, with two boundary conditions at, uh, at early and late times. And, uh, and this also defines um, a CFT on DS, but it's not the, I don't think this is the, what you would like the, the normal picture if you just, Right, just follow the the while um, the picture that you get from uh, from while transforming, if that makes sense. Right, you you can right you can impose boundary conditions, but I don't think it's the right thing to do if you want to study uh, CFT and DS. Well, I'm I'm not saying whether it's the right thing to do. <laughs> I think to do. I'm just saying that it seems that it would be giving solutions to your bootstrap equations. So that's all I'm saying. I'm I'm not making yes yes it. Uh... It um, it would, but yeah, but those are just those, right? So so those solutions are actually the, I think those would be just conventional, right? Known, say in two D CFT, right? This is just CFT on the annulus, so uh, we. Well, well, it's not conventional to well, have not, the entire conditions that you are imposing. Because yeah, I agree that the correlation functions in position space are the same, but. Um, yeah, it's it's a strange strange way to package a known known CFT. Yeah, I think. Um, but I'm not in, not. It's, it's about it's, these two. Uh, if I may, I think it's about these two things that Shota talks about. Where on the one hand, if you use this in informalism and you don't fix anything on the boundary, then for a CFT in the sitter, that in informalism would would yield. Um, uh, the trivial boundary at tau equals zero or eta equals zero. Whereas if you fix something at eta equals zero, so you fix some boundary conditions, then probably you get BCFT, uh, general BCFTs. Yes. Well, my yeah. point is that what is interesting that is if some construction like this works, then it like brings, like if you're, uh, if some construction like this works, and if your entirety conditions are correct in this construction, then it could give like positivity conditions about the CFTs that we did not consider for at least the same. So. Uh, so, sorry, but you, you, you mean that uh, if we take some, some boundary condition for CFT uh, in bulk, and then we calculate this like partial day coefficient, these i's that we have that have positivity condition, we just calculate them and check if it's actually the solution of the bootstrap equation. That's what you're saying. Well, the, sorry guys, I, I hate to say this, but the number of participants is dropping very rapidly. Uh, I think everybody's a little bit exhausted. Uh, so I suggest that this discussion continues in private. Does anything else? And okay, if not, we can thank Shot and Mateus for a wonderful joint seminar. Thank you. And sorry, next week we will have Avia Rabib uh, telling us about uh, renormalization group flows on line defects. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>